Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for this uh, discussion tonight about um, a, a collection of wonderful novellas, uh, some of which have been published in uh, Griffith Review and, um, and uh, another which is a standalone. Um, my name is Julianne Schultz and I'm the editor of Griffith Review and it's my great pleasure to be here again at, at the Wheeler Centre, which is always a wonderful, wonderful place to have a, a great conversation. Um, this event this evening is uh, a joint activity with the Wheeler Centre and Griffith Review. And I should acknowledge um, in that, um, that collaboration the Copyright Agency Limited because the Copyright Agency has basically sponsored the two novella projects now that Griffith Review has run. This is our second, our second collection of novellas. The first was published um, in 2012. Um, one of the reasons it's lovely to do things at the Wheeler Centre is that it's such, you know, it's, it's, it's a place where the, the history and traditions of writing and thinking are so physically present. And I think that's always a great, it's a great thing to be reminded of for those of us who are in this, uh, this writing and ideas business. Um, as I was uh, mentioning, this is the second novella collection that, uh, that we've published at Griffith Review. Um, the first was uh, a project that we, we decided, I think it must have been about 2010, we thought that, uh, that it was probably a time when the, 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 the changes of uh, literature and politics and publishing meant that, uh, sorry, that the changes of uh, <coughs> literature, politics, publishing and so on were creating an opening for fiction which was longer than short stories but shorter than a novel. Um, and I can't quite remember when, when that particular brainwave occurred to me but um, I was sort of quite pleased to see that at the time that it did we were slightly ahead of the curve of what was happening internationally. Um, and we, around, so in this sort of period as people have been adjusting to electronic devices for, for reading and thinking differently about the, the appropriate length of stories that can be published in, um, as short fiction, um, that we embarked on this novella project with, this, as I said before, the support for the, of the Copyright Agency. And around the same time, a whole lot of other organisations and publishers also started to experiment with this form, um, which was sort of interesting because it had been lost. Um, while there are, of course, some, some wonderful novellas that are really defining, in, you know, defining moments in the literature, whether it's uh, Death in Venice or Of Mice and Men or Clockwork Orange. I mean, there's a whole list of really spectacular novellas Novellas, they'd sort of fallen out of favour and partly it was about the sort of economics of, of publishing. You know, why would you buy a skinny little book for the same amount of money as you could buy a fat book? You know, it, was, it was a hard sell in, in a bookshop. In an electronic environment, that becomes very much, very much a different sort of proposition and it allows the sort of experimentation with form which I think had been lost sight of while publishing was being shaped by, by what could be sold in, in, the, uh, in the bookshops. Um, the... The, so the, this process of the um, of the revival, um, I mean, has been really terrific, and I think it's liberated a lot of writers to to be doing things which they maybe not have um, maybe not have thought about doing before. So at that point, I'd just like to introduce uh, my guests here this evening. On my immediate left is Jane Jarvis Reed, who's a writer from Melbourne, and her debut, debut novella, Midnight Blue and Endlessly Tall, won the inaugural Viva la Novella competition and was published by Seizure in 2013. Please welcome Jane. In, in the middle, I have uh, Megan McGrath. Megan's a fiction writer from Queensland. Um, her work's been, been published in, in a number of um, anthologies and, and journals, including Griffith Review, um, Meange and Seizure, Tincture, and, Tincture Journal, and was one book, one book of many Brisbane's um, a couple of years ago as well, which is um, a wonderful program that's run by the, by the libraries in, in, in Brisbane. Uh, she works for the Brisbane Writers' Festival and tutors at the Queensland Writers' Centre. Her story in the Griffith Review novella collection, Whale Station, is her most recent work. Please welcome me. And 
Uh, fine, the, our other guest this evening is Kate Kennedy, who's obviously very well known, I'm sure, to, to all of you. Uh, she's a very high, highly acclaimed and much loved Melbourne writer. Her novel, The World Beneath, uh, won a number of prizes, including the People's Choice Award, Award at the New South Wales Premier's Awards in 2010. She's written novels, she's published short stories in both anthologies and in, in journals and in international magazines. And she's also published a collection of poetry. Kate's uh, short uh, novella in this collection um, is the one that we're going to kick off with today. So please welcome Kate. Thank you. Now, the challenge that we had for this, this novella collection in Griffiths, was, uh, Griffiths Review, was that I really wanted to do something um, which was about historic, telling historical stories. It seemed to me that in Australia we'd forgotten about our history. I mean, we had a few iconic stories, we had a few bits and pieces that we kept on telling over and over again. But the richness and the complexity of the sort of little bits of history was being lost. Um, and so when we went to Cal with that proposition a couple of years ago, we said, look, you know, there's, there are big international books, there are local books which have made a real, a real impression in terms of this trying to tell history through, through fiction. But I want to see whether there are little stories or different sorts of stories which would really suit the sort of novella format. And let's see what, what we come up with. So in, this, in that particular case, what we did was we, we put out a call for writers and we asked people to come up with propositions and then we commissioned five. Five, five people to write and, and two of them are here tonight. Um, it was slightly a different exercise because I think um, in lots of cases and indeed with the novella competition that we're about to, to launch again, we'll ask people to send in fully completed works. This time we went to it around the other way. And Kate, your thinking in terms of the place of history and the telling of stories and how you work that back into into an, the creation of a novella, I think is, it really goes to the heart of one of those, that, that, the problem of that question. Mm. Can I read back to you a, a quote that, that you gave us when we were talking about it and then sure. ask you to reflect on it? <laughs> <laughs> if I can in this, small, in this small writing. You said, what fascinates me about writing, about, about recovering forgotten stories is how often they, they are the real tipping points for much bigger cultural defining moments and events. Often, that often come after them, all the more potent because they are invisible. It's a seemingly small piece which in retrospect jars us into discomfort and sometimes a reluctant reassessment. Mm. That's what you've done with this story, isn't it? Yes, I, I literally tried to do that. I, mm. I thought to myself, um, th that, does what, that is what interests me, I guess, the, the idea of this, the small thing, the little thing that is not noticed so much. Mm. And, I think it's our job as writers as well as people interested in history generally is to pay attention, mm. to pay attention to small things that are usually overlooked because often they seem to be the key to me that, as I say in that little quote, that sort of opens up this other vast thing that's happening behind it. And then we think to ourselves, of course, of course, I just didn't notice it, I've just sort of stumbled across it. Mm. And often those little things do seem to be um, in our path in that way, but we are persistently not noticing them. Mm. And uh, when I started with the story, I thought oh, it would be great to write a story where someone literally finds themselves reluctantly excavating something, mm. someone digging something out. Mm. Um, and it's something, about, as you said earlier, that problem with history is that we go down that cul-de-sac of simplification where there's just no going back. We end up with these few worn out, cliched, simplistic, kind of iconic mm. stories and that's meant to be all there is for us. That's meant to be the ones that we can have in our grab bag of mm. ideas about ourselves, mm. I guess. But to me it just seems there's endless sort of multiple narratives going mm. on there, seething under the surface that are waiting to break through. Mm. And so mm. I love that idea of I'm going to have someone actually digging yes. <laughs> to see what happens, yes, you know. Yes, and, who's, uh, and a character who's come in with a very sort of fixed and rigid preconception of what the place might be. I mean, because yes. yeah, it's the juxtaposition of those ten things in your story in a way, isn't it? That's right. It's yeah. people with an expectation they're going to find something and they're so determined to find it that they begin to kind of uh, make up their own history, I guess, and uh, create it for themselves. They're renovating an old hotel and uh, they really want it to be this kind of groovy bed and breakfast in this country town and uh, they'll do anything to kind of find some history that's going to make it appealing to the people who come and stay there to sort of, you know, have Burke and Will stayed here or, you know, Robert O'Hara Burke except in this bed kind of stuff. Um, and they... So the, the locals begin to bring things in. The locals want to have the, the bar open and uh, 
they, they help them out because they want to have that pub opened again. And uh, so they've put all this memorabilia everywhere. Mm. It's like an installation. It's like a theatrical sort of set of props. Um, but, of course, things have their own stories and mm. things have their own sort of provenances. And I guess that's mm. what I wanted to sort of find. The person telling us the story is the person who they employ to dig out their cellar. Um, and it's not everything that they hope that they're going to find mm. there. So. Spoiler alert. We'll and that's right. I'm not going to tell you more. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit yeah. more as we go on. So, Megan, in, if, if um, Kate was sort of animated by the sort of these multiple layers of history and so on, I mean, it seems to me that your piece um, is very much animated by a place and a place which is sort of recent but strangely distant. Yeah. Um, so... My novella is called Whale Station and it's set in uh, 1962 when the Tangaluma whaling station closed down on Morton Island and it's what happens to um, a few of the employees when they literally get to get there and there's, there's just no more work for them. And so the reasoning behind writing that story is because I grew up on North Stradbroke Island and so my family has quite a strong connection with that place and I realised that um, now that I live in Brisbane, there's a lot of people that, for one, haven't even been to North Stradbroke Island or Morton Island, um, and further, that a lot of people aren't familiar with the history that it has there, and it's just recent. It's the 60s. It's not even really that mm. long ago. And um, when this the theme came up for the Forgotten Stories, I was like, well, this is a story that's been forgotten, and if I don't, if I don't tell it, probably no one's going to tell it. Mm. So there's only one other book about the um, whalers of Tangaluma, which is a, uh, put out by the Maritime Museum, and it's about the ships. So, and that's it, really. That, that's it. So, so do you, just tell, tell us a little bit more about that whole whaling story in, 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 in South East Queensland, or it's actually an Australia-wide story, isn't it? So, yeah. Um, because so there I think was, it is forgotten these yeah. days. Yeah. So there was a couple of stations. There was one at Byron Bay, and there was one at, at Tangaluma, and they literally shut down because they ran out of whales. So... Um, <laughs> And that's the, that's the story that I'm, that I'm trying to tell. I'm not pro-whaling or anti-whaling. I'm just saying that we did this here and we did this here not very long ago. Mm. Yes, somebody said to me after reading it, it was sort of Moby Dick meets the Greens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so Jane, yours, yours, your novella is very much driven... It, it's very much located in a place. It's sort of inner northern Melbourne, but it's very much driven by character. So it's sort of different in its sort of genesis, I suspect, to, to the, other, the other two. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it was definitely the characters that started speaking to me before I had any notion of what the story was going to be about. Um, the novella is set here, kind of in two main places, in um, a sort of run-down old, probably California bungalow style in Brunswick and in a new renovated um, North Carlton terrace house. Um, I was working with two main characters, Eloise, who is... Uh, a middle-aged woman who's um, had a recent divorce and she's now working as a mental health carer, and her new patient, Eloise, who is um, probably in her early 30s and has experienced some sort of a breakdown. And these two lives, these two kind of lone women are sort of brought together into this carer-patient relationship. Um, I think working in the form of the novella allowed me to really put a magnifying glass on those two characters. There's just a single story arc, which is pretty common for a novella, and I, it just kind of allowed me to really uh, flesh out those mm. few key elements mm. and sort of turn those characters inward on themselves and turn the relationship inward on itself until it kind of, I suppose, implodes mm -hmm. for better mm -hmm. or for worse. Mm -hmm. Before we talk a bit more about the sort of processes of writing, the challenges of writing mm -hmm. these novellas, I'm interested from each of you about how these stories found you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always an interesting thing for, for creative people. You know, what, what, what made you write this story? Why did you feel you had to write this story <coughs> rather than something else? Mm -hmm. Do you want to keep talking about that? Sure. Um, well, I suppose I subscribe a little bit to that Jungian idea that all of your characters... Um, in your dream or in your story uh, yourself. So in a very uncomfortable kind of way, I suppose, I'm writing myself when I'm mm -hmm. writing these characters. Um, I didn't know the story that I was going to write when I started. Mm -hmm. I had a period of six months which I'd carved out just for writing. 
beautiful little time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, I was working on a few different projects and I started this novella, Midnight Blue, as um, an experiment. So every day I would work a little bit on it and I worked with three rules. So I had to write a little bit every day, didn't really matter how much. I wasn't allowed to reread anything until it was finished and um, I wasn't allowed to limit the story in any way. So when the characters wanted to say something or do something that I wasn't cool with, I had to let them do it anyway. Um, so they, so you weren't, they weren't writing to, to a plan that had been mapped out in advance? No, I didn't really know what was going to happen. I started to get an idea of where the story was going pretty soon. Mm. Um, the story kind of wrote itself in that way. Mm-hmm. So after um, a few months of doing that, I, I didn't realise I was writing the last scene, but I wrote the last sentence and suddenly thought, ah, oh, it's finished and I've got a novella. <laughs> and then I sort of forgot about it for about six months. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, what was, what was, how did you, I mean, you said before that, you know, you felt that you, a sort of a, an obligation in a sense that you, you knew these stories and so there was something that you could bring to it. But why, why about whalers? I mean, you could have written why about sand miners or, you know, any could number have. of different things. Yeah. yeah. I think the theme for the Forgotten Stories was... Um, quite important. I probably wouldn't have written this piece for anything else, so I'm so pleased it got in. (laughs) Um, But with this one, it started because I was having a conversation with my family almost a year ago, and we were, I was talking about the whaling uh, on Morton Island, and my sister, who's only um, about a year older than me, she had no idea. And so I thought that was really surprising that we both had grown up in the same, in the same place, but we had to different narratives of our hometown so that to me was and I was like well who else doesn't know about this story now and so I started um, one of the beauties of of being from the area is I started just asking people and met with a few people that did actually work over there and so my main character Rick is very loosely based on some anecdotes um, of a gentleman uh, Mr Lidsley Nash who still lives over there so I had the the pleasure of going over and, and talking with him and interviewing him and his wife mm-hmm. um, and to get some of those other um, there's sort of forgotten stories within those forgotten stories he's in his 80s now so he's um, you know forgetting a few things himself so to be able to to get down some of his his stories as well was really sort of special to mm-hmm. me so um, there's a few um, bits in there that go there's stories within the stories and a few um, like urban legends, I mm. suppose, particularly with um, Whale Rock and, and Whalebone Reef. There's a, a few other little stories in there that I get to tell, which, thanks to the novella, gives me space to do that as well. So, mm. yeah, it was definitely a, a story f- for that collection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. <laughs> Kate, how did you...? I, um, I really like um, primary sources. I like the kind of hidden life of objects. Mm-hmm. So when you find something that you find really intriguing... Um, uh, it, it, it makes you follow that trail. And mm-hmm. one thing I saw was a, um, uh, it was an artefact from a museum and it was a, it's a flag, one of the oldest ones we have in Australia. Um, and it was the, um, the Southern Cross flag, which was the one that was flown the Eureka Stockade. But it was exactly like that flag, mm-hmm. but it had written on it, Chinese out. Um, and it was from the Lambing Flats riots that mm-hmm. were seven years after Eureka Stockade. And I began to do a bit more research on mm-hmm. that flag um, and looking at... See, I don't know, I, at school I always felt very proud of that Eureka mm-hmm. Stockade history. We love that idea, don't we? It's like the big iconic thing, mm-hmm. the underdogs against mm-hmm. the, the police mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the you know, mining inspectors and, yeah, go... Um, but then we sort of we look at the history of that Southern Cross flag and it's been flown and, and all sorts of... Mm-hmm things maybe we don't feel quite so proud of. Mm. It's mm. been claimed, it's been part of the White Australia policy, mm. it's uh, often now used as a tattoo for mm. extreme mm. right-wing groups. Mm. Mm. So the more you kind of uncover, the more you sort of mm. find that stuff mm. of, of the hidden mm. life behind mm. the thing. Mm. Mm. Um, so yes, I, I just began to do a bit more reading and found out more about... I was a bit shocked to find the history of uh, the Buckland riots, which were some other riots very near where I live. Um, in North East Victoria, which I had never heard of again. Mm, mm. And yet, um, there they were, mm, mm. all around us. Mm. And there is a small plaque now in that area. Mm. But um, I certainly hadn't heard that history of Chinese miners being um, 
forced out by a huge rioting mob of people. Mm, mm, mm. Um, yep, so it was just one of those things where I was, I was shocked and surprised at that hidden history and I thought I could find, it's like you were saying, you find a way to put a story within a story to yes. frame it in a certain way and a novella is a fantastic framing device because you can, you can develop those ideas, characters can be invented um, that feel plausible, that uh, discover and uncover those ideas and feel just as uncomfortable as you do. Mm, so mm. it's got a nice way to yes. kind of bring that story to yeah. its kind of resolution. Yeah. I mean, it is, it, is an interesting, it is an interesting challenge, and I don't think it's confined to Australia, but I think that the nature of, of, the, of Australian settlement history mm. means that... Uh, and and the, the extent of the sort of migration patterns over the last, the last more 60, 70 years um, has meant that we've become reluctant to tell, or we just fail to tell the stories, because somebody's always coming new, who's yes. got something new to it. It's a new blank slate, you know, and here we can start all over again. Yes. So finding that sort of the layers that are there, you know, is, is actually, I think, a revelation to people as they, as they embark on it through, as you've described. You begin to wonder whether those things are willfully forgotten, you mm -hmm. know. There were certainly many, many more writing white miners at Lambing Flats rights and the were at the Eureka Stockade. Mm. But we mm. don't hear about that story so much. Yeah, you know. I think it's, um, particularly with my story as well, it's easy, people want to forget. Mm. People want to say, be looking out and making judgments all of the time. And it's really easy just to put down that curtain mm -hmm. and pretend that we didn't, that we're squeaky clean, that we didn't, that we didn't do anything. It's and look over here at this heroic yeah. thing over here instead. You yeah, know? yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it really is, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Is that is that something that you engage with in in your writing and thinking, Jane, as well? Any of that sort of that sort of those layers of history and so on? <coughs> Not necessarily in this piece of writing, but just more generally. Yeah, yeah definitely. I I sort of feel like we're at an interesting point um, in Australia and um, at the moment where we can kind of start to speak with a bit more honesty mm. about our stories and the stories that aren't ours, but. Um, maybe stories that have been silenced in the past. I think people are starting to open their ears a little more and be willing to hear those, well, those other voices. Mm. Mm. So the the challenge of the novella. I mean, Kate, you said before that you thought it was a was a great device for for this this mm. you know extending extending the range, but not not going too far. I mean, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, and how does it differ from the other forms of writing? That, that you know, I'm, I'm such a short story fanatic, mm. I guess, and short stories are really hard because of that brevity. Mm. But it's, I think I've been led to them because I think limitation actually is a fantastic thing in fiction. Mm. I love limitation in writing generally because you, you, you're swimming in this, and you're floundering in this world of language. There aren't any material limitations there mm. you know if you're a painter you've got limitations you've got you're working in two dimensions if you're a sculptor you've got mm. limitations according to you know but with writing what is there you just got this incredible world of language you're just going to spin something out of nothing mm. so to me it's like when you're spinning a sort of a plate on a on a stick and mm. <laughs> it's like this sort of the beauty of it is is the there's you know creating that sort of centrifugal force that, mm. that can make it happen and mm. a novel i must admit does seem to me that it's so hard. There's like 15 yes. plates on sticks yeah. and, and you're the clown who's, you know, putting out more and more and more and running back and trying to keep them all spinning. And uh, <clears throat> the short story is beautiful because it's just about one thing. Mm. <clears throat> but the novella, it's, I feel in my own limited way, I can kind of handle that kind of length mm. and it's mm. not too difficult because mm. one thing that can happen that's wonderful is characters can bounce off each other in terms of... Um, antagonism mm, mm. and that will push they push that plot further mm, mm. they push that story forward mm, mm. it's not something that's the universe coming from somewhere and making something happen and then we see somebody forced to change or something which is you know the kind mm. of classic arc in a novella you can add these complications and you have that luxurious space to just watch then what characters mm. do with that new challenge mm. and you watch what they do when things are uncovered and how they scramble to explain or to reassess or to react mm. in a way which is giving them a whole lot of new um, challenges in mm. terms of mm. um, now, how do you explain what you're doing now? How do you look at your behaviour now? You yeah. Know? Did you know your characters would find what they found when you started writing the story or did they find it as, as you found it? You know, during no, the I, I think I knew. They Look, let's just do the spoiler. No. <laughs> 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 
It's kind only of if you promise to thing. buy. Yeah. Only if you promise to buy it and read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they they want to make this kind of heroic, historic goldfield bed and breakfast. And what they find is a box that they think is going to have special historic things. And what's inside it are these pigtails that they have cut off as like a souvenir. It's like someone has, you know, it's like scalping. And that's what has been kept in this box as a kind of a souvenir. of. And that really did happen. It really did happen. Um, and I think what I'm, I remember seeing an engraving um, when I was researching the Buckland mm. riots mm. of someone grabbing a Chinese person or a mm. celestial, as they were called. You might have seen this picture yourself, mm. grabbing them by their pigtail. That was mm. how they would sort of grab them and then beat them up. And so one thing you would do would be mm. to um, mm. cut off that pigtail because mm. it was culturally very insulting for them. Mm. It was very mm. negating, dehumanising for mm. them. And people would keep those as souvenirs, often making them into a switch for a horse whip. Ugh. Anyway, it just makes mm. me feel... Mm. Ugh. It's not like a skull or it's not like a... Mm. But it's something where that's mm. a kind of a, a gruesome souvenir. Mm. So I think when I saw that picture mm. of someone holding this... There wasn't any photos. Mm. Someone had to... Some artist's impression mm. of what mm. those riots were like is mm. the thing that I remember seeing in the mm. paper at the time. Mm. And everything... I quote lots of things from the paper. Mm. Mm. I did find that newspaper and that's mm. exactly what was in the paper. Mm. I haven't mm. made up anything. Yeah, yeah, I've just yeah. found it myself and put yeah. it in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, it's very confronting. I mean, it's a, and it's beautifully written, so you know, the, the, knowing that won't spoil the story. Sorry, I hope it doesn't spoil the story. <laughs> yeah, it won't. Yeah. It'll add to it. <laughs> um, so, so uh, uh, Megan, in terms of your writing, I mean, in terms of the sort of challenges of, of writing to this sort of novella form, I mean, how, how did you find that differently? I mean, what was the sort of... How did you adjust? Um, I prefer to write short stories too, Kate. Mm. Um, and so I came at this as, as a way to... If you could put in all of the things that are normally just in the subtext of a short story, that's yes. how I sort of chose mm. to write it. So it is still just moving to one, one point and, um, and, and the, it's a lot of extra character mm. development that you can mm. do. Mm and the way that they, they change. It feels quite luxurious, doesn't yeah. it? You've got I, this yeah. space to kick around mm. that you don't usually have. And you didn't have to put any false... To, which you do with novel writing, that there's sort of, oh, you know, go up to this point and then shut that door down mm. and so your characters mm. need to recess. They're, all, they're still moving, so mm. it's got that momentum of a short story, which I really enjoyed, but then, yeah, mm. luxury of the extra words was, mm. was beautiful. Mm. And mine um, changed a lot with the research, the... Um, the story that I was was going to write, which is the same story, but some of the actions that they were that they were going to take, um, being confronted with this, um, that the well station was closed. Some of the things that they were going to try to do as I was researching, I realised that it was just completely Im impossible mm. and and ridiculous. Like at one point, I wanted them to go and build this boat, and they were going to go and be whalers on their own, which is <coughs> absurd, completely mm. absurd. And the boats mm. that they have to use are huge, mm. and it's not... In my head, I had pictured it as a bit of... Um, similar to a prawn trawler or something like that. And when I went to the Maritime Museum... You saw Museum, one of those Moby Dick paintings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have your, your knife just taped to the end of your broom handle and you can just go out there and get it done. <laughs> and so when I was doing my research at the Maritime Museum and um, the gentleman who had written the other book, The Whalers of Tangaluma, his name is um, David... David Jones, like the store. Um, I was lucky enough to meet with him and he gave me a lot of his research and a lot of his photos as well and, and talked about, about the ships. And, and so through that, I realised I needed to change what, what was actually going to happen. So mm -hmm. there's, um, without any spoilers, there is the scene in there where they go and they look at this boat, um, which is one of the first scenes that, that I wrote. And, and Christian, who's the Norwegian whaler, um, is trying to convince Rick that it's going to be fine. We can just we can just do up this thing, and and the boat is so bad it doesn't even have a motor in it. And Rick's like, "Come on, mate, mm. it's just not going to happen." Mm. And so that was, <clears throat> and being able to keep that in, mm. that was I guess that was a bit of a false start and mm. a bit of a plot point. Mm. Um, but that becomes a reassessment. Yeah, then, doesn't it? so yeah, yeah you can so use it everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of fun. Megan, was his name really Davy Jones? David. Uh, da <laughs> David Jones, sorry. Not but Davy Jones. Jones would be amazing also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's one called Ishmael as well. Yeah. 
Well, one of the things I really liked, uh, the character, the, 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 the descriptive stuff in, in, in piece in your work, Megan, about the, about the chasers, you know, and, and the mm. sort of move, mm. you know, the people who were doing the whale chasing and, you know, go, will they make it to Albany to where the, where the whaling business kept going longer than it did yeah. in South East Queensland? Um, I thought that was, there was something really powerful about that. That's yeah, a, a, so maybe in a sort of FIFO context, you know, that people are following this work. Yeah, they're, it they're working. Yeah. So um, the Norwegian crew... So the Australian in at Tangaluma, the Australians weren't in charge of actually um, capturing the whales. That was all Norwegians that came out, and so it would take them 72 days to sail out here from Norway, and then they would work for the season, which was May through to October, and then they'd sail home. And so it's not really a lot of time back in Norway before they turn around and, mm. and come out again. Mm. So um, there were some that would stay out here. Um, and not and not sail home, and so that's two of the characters that I've that I've got. They've um, mm. relocated out here, mm. and the story about how Rick becomes a whale chaser, so someone that gets to work on the boats, is true. <laughs> that he um, was just going to work on one of the other boats, which is the tow boat that that takes the whales from after they're captured and takes them back so that they can be processed, um, and one of the Norwegians got rip-roaring drunk and didn't make it and, and the character of Rick goes down and gets on, gets on this boat that he thinks is the tow boat but it ends up being one of the chasers and that's legitimately how um, mm. Mr Nash ended up mm. being a chaser because mm. he got on the wrong boat because someone was too drunk. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so capturing that was... was yeah. yeah, it's interesting. There's a, um, there's a, there's a terrific um, photographic installation at the um, at the beach hotel in Byron mm. um, where which was the whaling station as well you know of that you know that beach which is now you know the last place you would in any way associate culturally or in terms of lifestyle with whaling of the big whales blood you know the, the mm. whole the jetty that went out forever I mean mm. you know it, it, as you were saying before I mean this is quite recent but yeah. it's so profoundly different to yeah the, um, yeah, I got access to some photos as well that are actually owned by the Korea Mail, so um, I'm not allowed to share them. But there's one with these guys, and they're just muscly and tanned and just wearing no shoes, no shirt, completely unsafe, and they're standing with these flensing knives on top of the whales while they're um, processing them. And just to see that image... And then there's little kids, they're watching. Like, they used to go mm. over and watch. You could take your family over for the day to Tangaluma. A bit of blood sport. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And these kids with their little caps on. And it's just really, it's so recent. Mm. And now they go on the boats to look at the whales as they, as yes. they go past. Mm. Yeah. So, so. so you, this, is, this is the first novella that you've written, Jane. It is, And yes. your previous writing is primarily short stories, short That's fiction. Right. Yeah. yeah. So how did, I mean, you, you talked about, very beautifully about the process of, of creating it, but, I mean, when you reflect back on it now, I mean, how do you think differently? Do you want to do another novella or are you not so interested in that form? Well, I'm working on a novel at the moment mm -hmm. and I have worked on a novel in the past which I kind of wrestled for a few years well, several, more than a few probably, yeah. but it never quite sort of came yeah. together. But yeah. to me, a novella, it's just a beautiful amount of space. Mm. I was wanting to talk about um, intimacy and love and sex and boundaries, and to me, this is just the perfect space because yeah. I know I'm going to have you, all things going well, for a few hours on the couch, and you're just going <laughs> to... Hopefully, you're not going to get up and you're just going to read it through. And to have yeah. someone with you for those few mm. hours... Mm just feels like a cosy, beautiful mm. little mm. place. Mm. 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 So what's your next project, Kate? I'm um, struggling. I hate to hear you struggling with a novel, Jane, because I feel the same. I'm struggling with a, uh, a novel, but it's a kind of a novel in stories. Mm -hmm. So I've set myself this task to mm. um, uh, put it together. Speaking of plates on sticks, mm. my God. I <laughs> So it's kind of a series of self-contained chapters that make their own short stories. Mm. So there's kind of multiple viewpoints and it's um, kind of grounded in... Um, uh, so I, I guess I have to say climate change. Mm. It's, it's the sort of uh, the pressures that fall upon communities and individuals and mm. society, really, when mm. um, stuff we're not in control of mm. happens to us as a mm. result of stuff that... Um, 
nobody wants to look at mm, mm. to do with the way we're living. Mm. So it's looking at those sorts of pressures. And, uh, of course, it's very hard to finish because that is happening. Uh, you know, every time I look at it, I see mm. it sort of forming like this huge hydra uh, and changing. I can't seem to pin it mm. down. That's mm. right. So um, I'm just going to keep on persevering until... Mm. It's like you were saying, you feel like you've kind of got to the end and it's it's right size, it's right yes, shape. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in terms of doing that, I mean, are you approaching approaching it as an integrated whole or are you, are you approaching it as a series of things? No, it's an integrated whole, an integrated which makes whole. it okay. even kind of weirder because you, you yeah. really want the narrative to... You know, you have to do everything for a reason, that's the thing. Mm. Otherwise, why not just write a novel? Why mm. would I do that? So mm. you sit there for ages thinking why you're doing it that way. And... Uh, berating yourself about why you're yeah. doing it. But you want it somehow to be that, that the kind of the meta story, without sounding too pretentious, that the, the bigger narrative is stronger because it's made up of these multiple viewpoints mm. and that you're actually getting a view of a whole town mm. Mm. in a way which is... There isn't any right answer. There isn't mm. any one way of, of forging your way through mm. to come up with a better solution. Mm. There's just different people trying to form... A community mm. which is to do in terms of what well, I think with interdependency mm. Mm. and so that's people need each other mm. otherwise it's not really a community mm. Mm. Um, if you don't need each other then you're just basically a whole of houses living mm. Mm. side by side we really mm. chuck that word around very easily don't mm. we community yeah, we do. so I can see you sort of get a bit of a perspective on your on your own vision and then you kind of sort of see how it might fit yeah. together a bit better but meanwhile you're just piecing a whole lot of stuff together you're not really sure how it's going to come together until you just keep writing through it so listening to you talking about that researching Megan is very interesting yeah. to me because as you as you're doing it you're discovering what you're on about mm. I guess mm. in a way you just know you're drawn to it and mm. you it's going to keep your attention so you have to hope it's going to keep someone else's Those attention as well yeah, yeah. I Jane, think a story yeah. kind of find its finds its form as well if if you're as the writer if you're listening to the story and you're open to it becoming what it needs to become I think that a story has a kind of true fit or the right yeah. form for it to grow into and the way you're working Kate at the moment with the many stories that are going to form a larger story it doesn't sound like it could be any other form than the form that it's becoming yeah. and that's that's the thing that's kind of mm. a bit annoying is you because <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you go down that track and you feel it kind of curing into shape yeah. and then it's not so fluid anymore because yeah, yeah. you're committing to something mm. um but the same I love that idea that would it be great to think that you have an idea and you think what am I going to make out of this and you're so open to what it might be that it might be a poem or a short story mm. or a novel or, I don't know, a libretto, I don't know, anything, all the stuff mm. you haven't even tried, a performance mm. or mm. something. Or mm. I love that thought that mm. we can actually honour the material mm. even if we don't know what we're doing really, mm. really well. We just mm. want to make sure that we're doing the best job we can to give someone the jolt that something has given us mm. in, the, in the most honest way we can, mm. which is how fiction works in a way which is really true to me. Yeah. So. It's interesting because because of what, what we do with what I do with Griffiths Review, you know, is we choose a theme or a topic or whatever and then commission widely, I mean, in a way to get those different points of view. Yeah. And, and some of them will be because people have got different ways of, of, of thinking about the same subject. Some of them will be different styles of writing and so on. And and the most the most exciting part of it in many ways for, for us, and I say this now having done it for however many years, 11 years, um, is, is that pro process of compilation at the end. So we've got all the pieces together and we're doing, we're, the next edition is on, is about Western Australia, we're doing it at the moment. And the, the trying to get the voices to work so that they complement each other, add yeah. to each other, so that, you know, the dedicated reader who wants to start at the beginning and go to the end will actually get a different sort of experience of mm. the layering of those those voices mm. than you would get in you know in from any one of them, and so I sort of I mean it's it's mm. it's an edit it's a curatorial task in a way it's quite different to what you're doing but it's but there is a similar sort of element. The, the in intent that. is the same. It's mm. like how to do this justice, yeah. you know, how to yeah. do this in the best way yeah. to yeah. do it justice and to let that story sort of. I had I had a workshop last week and I was describing to these students like that had had a just sort of put a metaphor into a story. It's like you're like a butler. That's what it feels like. You're a butler, mm. and and you make something and you just want to just put it there on the table and then just go discreetly back away. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want and any... people stumble across it and say, "Oh, I didn't know." <laughs> yes, <laughs> I guess yeah. in a way it yeah. is yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, thank you, all canopies. Yeah. You, know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't know who to thank because the story's right there. Yeah. It's sort of you yeah. want to do those stories that you're uncovering that you're fascinated yeah. by. 
And yeah. the way you compile them, you're making an emotional journey for a reader in yeah. the same kind of way that a writer yeah, is by saying, let's place this against this. Mm. The stuck to, you're doing it as a kind of an intentional gift yes. in a way, you know. Yeah. So it's yeah. you want to do it justice in that way. Yeah. Jane, one of the things that I think very strongly is that, that your story illust- or your novella illustrates very beautifully is is the importance of voice and point of view. Um, I mean, your, char- your two key characters have very distinctive, you know, there's a very distinctive sort of voice that attaches to them. I mean, I'm just interested in your sort of thinking about how you, how you manage that, you know, in a craft sense almost. Mm. Mm. Uh, to me, that's the most fun part of it pretending to step inside someone else's perspective for the space of a short story or a novella. Um, I think as a writer I like to challenge myself as well and I'll have an inkling of the voice that is starting to come and then I think, okay, who can I be here or who can I be that's the furthest away from who I am? And even whilst I'm writing them and they're, I don't know, a 50-year-old man who's a sexist bigot, then maybe I'm, I'm writing him but I'm thinking... There must be something. I'm writing him and I'm, I'm feeling what this character, I think, is feeling. There must be something that connects us. So I think, I think what excites me about that use of voice and um, use of varied voices as a writer is that you get to exercise your empathy mm. and you're encouraging the reader to exercise their empathy as well and saying, you're a million miles in person or geography from this person, but see how he's you too. Mm-hmm. But I think it's selfish because mm-hmm. it's fun for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I think it's probably time for mm. questions. So we've got a couple of microphones. Mm. Um, there's a man in the middle. There are three yes. men in one, two, three. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what everyone's opinion is on the, the label novella <clears throat> and how what, whether you think that limits from an audience's perspective, um, the want to read it or even pick it up in the first place, mm. when really they could just be called novels. As, as in, like, is it, would it, could it be better to just leave it at that or, or is it bit like treading a dangerous ground to call it? <laughs> I think um, <coughs> as short story writers, um, we're already terrified <laughs> <laughs> because pe- we were constantly told that nobody wants to read short stories and yet Mm -hmm. short stories sell really well and people enjoy reading them and I think with the novella as well and part of the revival is that we're grooming readers to want to read something of that length and like you were saying like the intimacy that you get of being able to sit down with something that you can just read in one sitting it's an afternoon you don't have to carry it around in your handbag for seven weeks, like <laughs> Shantaram or something. <laughs> um, I think that's beautiful. And, and I noticed as a short story writer that short stories in Australia sort of hung out around that, you know, 3,000 word length. And then they started getting shorter. They're getting shorter and shorter, flash fiction, and mm. micro fiction, mm. 99 words. And then, <laughs> and then Nobody wanted to read that anymore, and I think with long reads and um, and novellas, people are looking for that now. Um, you're right when you say it's just a label, but if we're all sitting in North America and we're just written three eighteen thousand word stories, we'd be calling ourselves short story authors. It is just a name. It's just a thing about length. It's just a way to kind of categorise a story in terms of its kind of clarity and intent and how it's put together mm-hmm. and it is, it is different from a 400 page novel mm-hmm. to read something as you said that you can read mm-hmm. easily in one sitting but you know ne- never say never we'd, we'd love to say that's well that's my definition of a short story be read in one sitting it's like well mm-hmm. how long how long do you sit are you a fast yeah. reader like, <laughs> <laughs> how long are we sitting yeah. how long are we sitting that's yeah. right so yeah. I, I, I do think it is just a label and it is it's a little it's a little slim thing and it doesn't mean that it's not intense and rich I mean some of the greatest writing I think in English is novella is short, is slim novels Mm, you know, mm. beautiful little gem like novels Mm, mm. which uh, I keep returning to again and again because I just Mm. admire them so much, Mm. I don't know how they've done them Mm, it's just mm. a wonderful thing Mm, to mm. see so I don't know, it's just a name you know 
Yeah, I mean, it is just a name, but, but but the length does then force, you know, I mean, it's not like there is one format or one style, you know, there's a whole lot of different things, but but the discipline of of a certain amount of brevity does yeah. does force force a whole lot of other decisions. Yes. Um, and I think that that's, that's where the strength of it, in a way, comes a from. Distillation you know, of ideas. It's a distillation, mm -hmm. but it's not so spare that, you know, that you're left. And, it, I mean, you can have quite, I mean, there are novellas which are quite interior, interiorly focused um, mm -hmm. works. Um, but you, you know, it, in many of them, they're not. There's not that the, the richness of the interior life that they that they may be in a much longer work. Uh -huh. um, mm. So yeah. yeah, it's it's. I mean, I think it's interesting. And I, look, I think it's it's partly about um, it's about the writing that's right for a time, in a sense. You know, everyone's feeling so pressured in terms of the amount of stuff that's available, the amount of time they've got to read it. You know, that, that I, you know, I, I say it slightly in jest, but, you know, that notion of going in and spending $30 on on a Ian McEwan book, which is that fat, or spending $30 on a book that's that fat, you know, mm. that, that, that in the sort of publishing world, I mean, I think that that was something that, you know, people were conscious mm. of for, for a time. I mean. And that's, that it's dissipated is is interesting. So these things go around. I mean, I think that the novella, you know, when you first see it in sort of 14th century Italy, you know, in the, the Decameron, you know, is that mm. there is the you know the the stories that are, that are a series of novellas, you know. Um, so it's sort of it's an honourable tradition which is very long, you know, in in many languages. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple. There's a question at the back. Yeah. Um, thanks, ladies, for your, your uh, time tonight. Um, firstly, Kate. In regard to what you just mentioned about North America, do you think that's because there's a bigger market for literary journals and that kind of stuff over there? Like Dennis Johnson writes novellas all the time and they're then published yeah. in single format. Yeah, and there's Kindle singles, which are novellas you know, as well. You know, There's all kinds of ways that people are finding to publish that stuff. But certainly um, when I first began to write short stories, it was yeah, Australia sort of said, oh, no, in Australia we would say... 3,000 or maximum 5,000 words is a short story, but anything above that is... It, was, it seemed to be that we only define things in terms of length, not in terms of kind of quality or depth or clarity. And, yeah, I think, that the, I think there are many more opportunities for those longer short stories in the US um, because certainly that's where people make their name doing that. It's the other thing about brevity and distillation is it actually is fantastic for showing what you can do. Mm. It's, it really shows who can do it who can do that paring down, who can compress, who can write dialogue that does what, you know, 10 chapters of exposition would do and that kind of stuff. So I would say, yeah, North American writers, um, the ones that I meet, find it really odd that we write 3,000 word short stories and we, you know, often we joke that they just don't know when to shut up and that kind of stuff. But <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but yeah, 12,000, 14,000 words is nothing. Um, having said that, um, I've had a couple of things published this year in US um, magazines and they love the, the shorter the better at the moment. That mm. means they can get more things into that mm. magazine. So mm. I guess in hard copy at least it's, bec it's becoming an issue. Look, I think mm. the other thing in the US which is sort of relevant is, is that sort of um, the, the cycle of creative, creative um, output which may end up in film. You know, so if you look at the sort of the transfer from novella to film, it's mm. actually a much easier sort of transfer than a novel to a film. That's I mean, true, a novel yeah. has just got so many extra layers. It's, you know, the, 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 at its essence, if it's going to be reduced to a film, it, mm. something has to give. And, and in a way, I think in that what is very commercial sort of market, the people are thinking about novellas or, you know, these things which are somewhere between you know, 10 mm. and, and 25,000 words, because they may have a life that is easily translatable into another format. That's well. true. I'm sure, you know, he, Annie Pruel would say mm. Brokeback Mountain is a story. Mm. It doesn't matter what the length of the story is. It's just some are long and some are short in mm. that collection, and Brokeback Mountain was the one that was mm. optioned to be made into a, a beautiful film because mm. those elements are really clearly and beautifully expressed. Mm. And it's the same, you know... Lots of Stephen King's novellas are made into really effective no, films and mm. they seem to work better. Even um, The Shawshank Redemption, one of the longest films, yes. <laughs> was actually a much That's shorter right. yeah. novella and it yeah. was the adaptation let it kind of become to richer and more, more visual yeah. and more yeah. cinematic. So yeah. never say never. <laughs> um, I have one more question if I may yeah, be sure. so bold yeah. and hog the microphone. Um, <laughs> question, ladies, on novellas and linear timelines and narrative do you think novellas are better suited to st 
straight straight up chronologies, or can you mix them up? Or mm. apologies for not reading your novellas. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm thinking about the lover, Marguerite Duras, the lover, oh. and that mixes up the time. We're hearing her speak in the present tense as an old woman about um, when she was a young woman, and I think it works beautifully. I, I don't think the novella necessarily demands a linear time mm. sequence. What do you guys think? Mm. You know, I feel I've only just barely got my hands on the wheel and I, t- <laughs> I, I go for a linear chronology just because that's how I can see it laid out in front of me and I love it. I love convention. I'm a really conventional writer. I feel that convention, that the form is just so capacious. There's so much room to do so much just starting at the beginning and going on and getting to the end. <laughs> it just seems... Fine to me. I've got, <laughs> I've got plenty to be going on with in that. But at the same time, if yeah. there was a reason for making discontinuous narrative or chopping it up or having someone looking back and then showing, yeah, yeah. you know, stories within stories seem to be yeah. what is emerging to me. I think as long as you know where it actually fits, if you did iron it all out, then you can break it up mm-hmm. and do anything that you want with it as long as you know where it's going. Mm. And the important... What I feel the novella does well is move to... It's just moving to one point. And so that does lit, lend itself to a, a linear structure and I could talk mm. about narrative structure all night, mm. which I won't. Um, mm. But, yeah, there, there are other devices that you can use to be more creative with your storytelling. And, like, Kate, yours switches tense at the end, mm. which I thought was really... Which was really beautiful and because that jumped forward and and change that pace and that was and that mm. was lovely and, that, and really simple really easy to do so mm-hmm. when, when i think i mean i think that uh, there is there is some playing around in in the five stories that we've got in this collection i mean there's uh, john kinsella plays around with 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 t- time and place in in his piece which is set in set in western australia around the sort of camellia sort of story but he he moves between in time in that in that story in that piece, um, Masako Fuki Fuku is is more linear in her piece, and and in a way, the most linear of the stories that we've got, the pieces that we've got in this is um, me uh, is um, Emma Hardman's, which is about a story about the 1919 influenza e- epidemic, and it's it works through you know in a very in a quite sort of chronological sort of way, but about a very particular time. So in this in this, I think maybe that the historical framing probably mm. invites that um, invited that sort of approach this time because I think that in the first novella project that we did there were a couple of pieces which were qu- did use quite a lot of discontinuous narrative yeah. and were quite sort of you know doing subheadings and all sorts of things and chapter breaks and yeah, yeah yeah and and changes of voice and character in time and location you know so it was quite there were, there were a couple of pieces which were quite ambitious in in the way that they did that and, mm. and they worked you know they were, mm. and maybe that's when you're looking at stuff which is historical that you're uncovering something it's story-like. You don't need to muck around with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Life is always going to show us something in terms of story which is so beautifully self-evident that maybe that's just, once again, to try and just do it justice. You don't need to need so little revision sometimes, those stories. Yeah. It's just, it's right there. You know? it's, it's interesting because when I first... Um, made the application to to Cal for money for money for it. I mean I was very conscious of, you know, the big historical novels, obviously, you mm. know, the, the Kate Grenville stuff or the you know, the Hilary Mantels and, and so on. But I was also very influenced. There were a number of books that came this is a few years ago, there were a number of books that came around which really played around with what you what you can know and how different sort of perspective, you know, sort of a quite postmodern sort of take mm. on on historical yeah. writing. Um, and so I was sort of you know, in the framing of it, I was really hoping that I was get, we were going to get pieces that people were playing around with the form and what do you really know, you know, how do you layer this, you know, depending on the sort of perspectives and so on. And I was sort of uh, secretly hoping that we were going to get some of those in this trawl. It didn't happen, so that's all right. But there are plenty of times for Nothing it to... Nothing experimental. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. I mean, but it's sort of... It, it is interesting because... Um, you know, I think that the form, the, you know, the, the, just having that constrained word length opens up possibilities, but it cl- maybe closes down some others as well. Mm. Um, yeah. So there's a question back there. Yep. Um, I wonder, you are saying before, Jane, about a story finding its own form. And I, I wonder, I mean, Midnight Blue and Unless You Toll is such a, had such a beautiful momentum to it that you, you chose to end it 
at the moment of implosion, as you say, about the mm. relationship. And, but for me, having finished it, I felt like in my head, the story kept going. And I wonder how it is you, you made such an elegant decision to, to stop it when you did. And whether perhaps it's a novel is, is, is that, but with another act added onto it. Mm. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I'm, as a reader, I always appreciate when the writer leaves something that I have put together in my mind unsaid, and I suppose I'm seeking to do that as well. Um, but isn't that a wonderful tribute that your character he wants to know what's happened to your character, mm. so they've, you've fully animated them in, in, right. in, on, mm. in his mind. He'll keep writing yeah, the rest. That's good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we all aspire to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions here? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a very amateur, long-term short story writer. I uh, felt before I get buried, I'd better write a novel. So I've got my characters, I've got the end, and as I work it, I find, look, this is really only a short story. But I don't want to write a short story, I want it longer. Yeah. <laughs> and so I start stringing it out. Uh -huh. And I suspect now it's a novella. The, it's <laughs> it's um, two characters only, don't go into them very deeply, uh, single uh, element, single yes. uh, climax. Um, what did, what, uh, and I can appreciate from your point of view that a novella length doesn't depend on, oh, I've got to get to 30,000 words. Sure. It depends on what you had to tell. That's right. And how long it took to tell it. But if I went to, um, uh, where I'm used to going to three to 5,000 words, if I went to 25 uh, and I think, oh, that's enough, uh, I've got a novella. Have I still got a novella if I was at 50? <laughs> <laughs> That reminds me of Raymond Chandler. Someone said to him once, what happens you run out of ideas? He says, I never do. I just have someone come in the room carrying a gun. <laughs> 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 Make things worse, complicate things. It's like, yeah. that, that's that plotting thing, isn't it, I guess? But it's going to be as long as it needs to be, yeah. isn't it? The story, it's like Jane was saying so eloquently before, the story finds its own kind of length and depth and breadth, I guess. And it's, you have to somehow try and do that justice, I think, you know. And I think maybe the words, it's not about the number, it's about the story. So if you can write just a cracking short story with your two characters mm. and, and going to where they're going, wouldn't you prefer to do that, to have this perfect short story than to have 25,000 words but you might not need 20,000 of them? Mm, maybe. <laughs> I think when you start getting bored of what you're writing, you know you're about 20,000 words over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and because, because I operate in a, in a world which is somewhat constrained by um, terms and conditions, um, we've just announced the, uh, the novella competition for next year's uh, Griffith Review collection and we've said that the word length is somewhere between 10 and 30,000 words. So that's, um, you know, that's a pretty big... Big, big range, but um, hopefully um, that may be a place for your thing. Go to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, if, oh, sorry, there's one more question here, and then mm. I think that'll probably yep. we need to wrap up. Do any of you have some uh, favourite novellas? Uh. Yes, I am very fond of um, Animal Farm mm. and of Mice and Men, mm. I would say. I would return to them a lot. And there's other novellas I love for their decisions. Like because I, you feel flummoxed and then full of admiration for why, why Nick Carraway is the narrator of The Great Gatsby, for example. That's that's mm. a decision. Mm. Yeah. That's a choice that the author's made. It's not accidental. Mm. So, craft-wise, there's lots of novellas that I love and return to because I mm. want to, you know, read them again to not so much work out how to do it, but why we do it. Why do it? You know, <laughs> why make those choices and and try and sort out how you can be as audacious, mm. I guess. Mm. Yeah, you guys? I'm going to sound really cliched here and say The Old Man and the Sea. Um, and, it's a, and it's choices as, as well, so to have two characters that don't have, have names, I think that's... Yeah. Mm. And you can still feel so strongly for them. And um, I quite enjoy, which might be shorter than a novella. Is it a long short story? I don't know. Um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. <laughs> 
Yeah, which is really important to me when I was growing up. And it's a very sort of yeah. strategy sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, isn't it? It's yeah. a fable. <laughs> yeah. Novella fable. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is, I'm not, I bought it again and read it, um, recent, read, read it recently and I didn't, mm. it's, it's changed. <laughs> 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 They've done something, but, um, but that's not, it hasn't ruined it. But those small, those small volumes and, um, yeah, there's so many. Steinbeck is phenomenal. Mm. Yeah, he does some good work. What about you, Jay? Um, well, I loved Helen Garner's The Children's Bark, mm. but the one that really sticks with me is um, a really strange, quite darkly humorous novella by the Israeli writer Edgar Caret. Oh, yeah. Um, it came out in a collection of his short stories called The Bus Driver Who Wanted to Be God, and the story is called Nella's Happy Campers. And it's set in an afterlife, which is only for people who have ended their own lives. Um, but he somehow manages to kind of negotiate this territory in a really quite funny kind of still grim but humorous and enlightening sort of way. Um, and he's dealing with this very alien world, but he's still making the reader kind of laugh and nod their head and say, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that one. Mm. Great. Well, thank you all so much for sharing this with us this evening. It's been a, it's been a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Oh.